Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to the first lecture of the new 24th cultural season of Dar al Athar al Islamiya. Unfortunately, Sheikh Hassa will not be able to attend the first part of the season because she will be with her husband, Sheikh Nasser Sabah al Ahmed while he is receiving his medical treatment abroad. We wish him speedy recovery. Our thoughts and prayers are with them. Please allow me to remind the members who have not renewed their membership to please do so. And this is a, an opportune time to invite those who have not registered yet this is the time to do it, to, to join the expanding family of Dar al Athar Islamiyah. Since Dar al Athar Islamiyah began its yearly cultural season 24 years ago, the Tarak Sayyid Rajab Museum has participated with us, beginning with a lecture by the museum's curator, the late Dr. Geza Paraveri who also became Hungary's ambassador to Kuwait. This became a custom. And in talking with the warm relationship between the two organizations, it has become a tradition. The Dar now opens every season with the annual Tariq Rajab Museum Lecture. The son of the founder, Dr. Ziad Said Rajab, has been following in the path of his parents by giving the opening lecture, which deals with some aspects of the museum's collection. He has done so on topics that reflect the vast variety of objects in the collection. The Sabah collection shares an affinity with the Rajab Museum. The collections of both developed from the hands-on efforts of their founders. Both were endangered during the horrific events of 1990 and 1991. Most importantly, both survived and are active even more than before. Tonight, Dr. Ziad Rajab will be delighting us with a presentation that is not only informative, but also aesthetically pleasing. He has always spoken on a variety of subjects based on the collection, each different from the previous. His father, Tariq Sayyid Rajab, collector, artist, and archaeologist, founded not only the Tariq Rajab Museum, but also the New English School. In 2007, his large collection of calligraphy has been opened to the public in a new venue, the Tariq Rajab Museum of Islamic Calligraphy. In present, his presentation tonight is entitled Islamic Chinese Calligraphy in the Tariq Rajab Museum of Islamic Calligraphy. Dr. Ziad will also discuss the history of the Arabs in China, the development of Islamic Chinese calligraphy will be illustrated with examples from the museum. It goes without saying that even in a collection as many faceted as that of the Rajab Museum, or Rajab Museum collection, no mobile phones were, will exist, at least as examples of calligraphy. So, your mobile phone here should be turned off. And let's welcome Dr. Ziad Said Rajab. Thank you, Mr. Badr Bahijan. Always very flattering. I'm um, so, um, uh, well, I hope I meet some of your expectations. And um, I'd like to thank you all, first of all, for being here tonight. It's nice to see people that I see year in and year out. Um, so I'm very happy. And um, I'd like to thank. Sheikh Hissa and Dar al uh, for in 
inviting me yet again to give this talk, which is an honor for me. But uh, I'm very sorry not to see Sheikh Hissa here. Of course, I knew she was abroad with her husband. And as Mr. Bedr said, um, I'm sure we all wish uh, Sheikh Nasser the best recovery and uh, hopefully to see Sheikh Hissa back here again. As I said, it's always an honor for you to invite me to give this first talk. But even more than that, it's, at, it's my pleasure because um, giving this talk gets gives me an opportunity to look into different parts of our collections in the museum. And for a few years now, I've been thinking about this uh, Chinese Islamic calligraphy. I never know whether to call it Chinese Islamic calligraphy or Islamic Chinese calligraphy. Islamic calligraphy from China. Um, I've, I'm interested in it because I've always been very interested in China. And uh, so that is a sort of link um, of what we have to China. But I, I really don't know very, didn't know very much about it at all. And um, there actually isn't very much research done on the subject. It was very hard to find things. But I, I was quite uh, lucky in that in the last uh, two, three years. I've been to China a few times. and. I visited uh, some very interesting uh, monuments and places which have relevance to what we're going to talk about tonight and also met some interesting people like one of their quite well-known calligraphers. And so, as the title said, I'm talking to you uh, tonight about the Ch uh, Chinese Islamic calligraphy which we have in our Museum of uh, Calligraphy in Jabriya. And, um, but, so ultimately, I'm going to be towards the end of the lecture, showing you examples of the calligraphy that we have in the museum. And by calligraphy, I mean not only on paper, but there's some on China and metalwork and so on. Um, but just to make it a little bit more interesting, um, I thought it would be nice to talk about um, the history of the interaction between the Middle East and China, uh, a very interesting subject, which goes back at least to Nabataean times, there were indications that um, there were links between the Arab world, or the Middle East at least, and uh, China um, during Nabataean times. But for our purposes, I'm talking um, mostly about uh, when Islam arrived in China and the first official embassies started arriving at the Tang court there. Um, very interestingly, just as an aside, uh, which I didn't expect, uh, some. Mr. Faisal gave me a very interesting book this evening because he's done a little bit of research on the Chinese civilization and Arab heritage. I wish I'd had this book before I started. It would have been useful. So, as I said, there are indications um, that there are trade links between the two, but um, from uh, the Muslim period, which uh, um, was in the early to mid uh, seventh century in China, um, according to what the Chinese believe and according to what the Chinese Muslims definitely believe, um, the first Muslims from Arabia, Arabia arrived in Chang'an, which was the capital of the Tang Empire, uh, in 629 AD. Um, although, uh, I mean, there's no clear evidence for that, but the Muslims in China hold this to be a fact and so do some scholars. And again, uh, according to local beliefs in China, especially very strong beliefs with the Muslim co community, is that the first mission to China, the first Islamic mission to China, included uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, who was a relative of the Prophet, and who came at the head of a delegation to um, introduce Islam. And I've seen Ethiopian sources for this, and, um, and Chinese ones. And, um, According to the Ethiopian um, source that I found, it said that in the year uh, 615 AD, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas traveled from Ethiopia to Chittagong in present-day Bangladesh, and from there to China, arriving in China in 616 AD. There are other sources, of course, uh, that indicate that the first um, formal introduction of Islam in to China was when the third uh, caliph, uh, Khalifa Uthman, dispatched an official delegation in the year 651 AD, 
with, the, again, the purpose of introducing Islam to China. But the first uh, delegation officially mentioned in Chinese records was uh, in 713 AD, when an envoy was uh, presented at court who refused to kowtow or to bow to the emperor because he'd only bow to God. And the Tang emperor did, didn't have him killed, because, uh, the, he, which he normally would if it was uh, a Chinese person, because he believed that a difference in court etiquette uh, ought not to be considered a crime. But when they had the um, second embassy, which arrived in 726 AD, the ambassador did kowtow to the emperor, and uh, so he was showered with many gifts and, and honors. Um, before I continue, I'd like to just show you um, some of the uh, Chinese dynasties. So, um, I mean, uh, around the Qin dynasty is maybe when the Nabataean connection existed, but we're more concerned with the right. Um, Islam first came during the Tang dynasty, the top one, and, and it flourished through the Song of the Yuan, which is the Mongol dynasty, and then the Ming and the Qing. So, um, Chinese Muslims believe that um, very strongly that six years after the arrival of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas uh, to Guangzhou, he received permission from the emperor to build a mosque, which is considered um, the oldest mosque in China. So this is the Huaisheng Mosque in uh, Guangzhou, and um, considered the oldest mosque in China. In addition, um, uh, the Chinese Muslims, as well as um, Chinese scholars, believe that Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was buried in China, and there's a, a shrine in Guangzhou to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, which is very um, heavily visited. Many people go there. This is his tomb in the shrine, and that's the shrine itself. Now, um, of course, other sources say that uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was buried in Medina, which is probably the more correct um, history. But whatever the truth, his connection to China is very, very strong. Um, whether he visited or not, whether he's buried there or not, but he's a very, very important figure to the Chinese Muslims. And um, uh, so the Tang Empire um, was one of the most cosmopolitan and open empires in, in Chinese history. And there was a lot of uh, interest on the part of the emperor and his court in other countries and other cultures. So when the first Muslim delegation arrived, they were received very warmly and with a lot of enthusiasm. And during the 8th century, the Arabs were the largest community, foreign community in uh, Chang'an, which was the capital at the time. This Tang dynasty was considered uh, a golden age in China and a period of much commercial, religious and cultural connections to places as far as Japan and the Abbasid Empire. They um, encouraged the arts and literature and painting and music, and, and um, uh, they absorbed influences from foreign cultures. For example, with Tang Dynasty dance, there's a lot of Middle Eastern influence and music. And so the Emperor Taizong, who was the second Tang Emperor, is considered one of the greatest leaders in, in China's history, and uh, he created what they call the Grand Age of cosmopolitanism and multiculturalism. Um, there's a story about this emperor, and uh, it's recorded in many Chinese Muslim scholarly books, but also in uh, Chinese, uh, uh, regular Chinese historical books, that this emperor, Taizong of the Tang Dynasty, dreamt about a monster. And with this monster, he, he dreamt of a very elegant, tall man wearing a turban and wearing green robes. And he described um, to his advisors when he woke up that this monster had a very ugly face with red hair and big teeth. And um, the, the tall, elegant man um, was speaking in a, a language he didn't understand. And... Um, pushed the monster away, basically. It's a, it's a long dream and uh, it's a long writing in Chinese books, but when the emperor woke up, um, he asked his advisor about it, and one minister came up to him and said he'd heard that these people are, um, whom the Chinese call the Hui, 
uh, Huawei. Um, uh, they lived in a place called Arabia. Of course, they have a Chinese name for it, and that they had a king called Muhammad. And he gave a very sympathetic report of the Muslims and uh, the Prophet, saying they were sincere, true, and respectful. Um, and so, what this dream did was it led them to be very warmly welcomed by the Chinese emperor when the first Muslim delegation came. This is what scholars believe, or it could be a, a story that's made up, but they believe that um, their welcome in the Chinese, in the Tang court was because of the emperor's dream. And um, so, now I mentioned earlier the Huaisheng Mosque, the oldest in China, which was built in the mid, uh, seventh century, uh, early to mid seventh century. And it, it sits on a very large area. Um, it's not a very nice area now, but um, it was the center of where the Arab and Persian um, community lived, which was very large um, throughout history, uh, merchants mainly. And um, the mosque is known as the Lighthouse Mosque because for many, many centuries it was the tallest building in Guangzhou, which is Canton, and used to guide ships into the harbor. And this is from a, uh, a European um, print showing the mosque there on the left behind the ship, um, as you can see there on the left um, too. And so um, it used to guide ships into the harbor to Guangzhou. Uh, the, the oldest part of the mosque is actually the lighthouse, um, and, uh, but the rest of the buildings mostly date to the Ming and the Yuan and the Qing dynasty. Um, of course, they were wooden structures, so it would have um, been destroyed over the centuries. But the mosque is very ancient. Another very ancient mosque in China, a beautiful mosque, is the Great Mosque of uh, Xi'an, which was built in 742 AD. And um, again, most of the mosque is Ming Dynasty and Song Dynasty, but um, there are some stone tablets in the mosque which um, date back to around the time the mosque was uh, um, founded. And um, um, so, I mean, most mosques in China, especially in, in Eastern China, look very, very Chinese. There's just one mosque in a city called Guangzhou, which is uh, partly abandoned, which has a, a little bit of a Middle Eastern look to it. Um, there are many other mosques built around China um, at the time. This is the interior of the mosque, um, which is the Huaisheng Mosque. Um, in, also in Xi'an, which is actually older than the uh, Great Mosque of Xi'an, uh, and it was built in 705 AD, this one. Um, very beautiful architecture too, and they all have lovely gardens. And um, also the very famous New Jia Mosque in Beijing, which was um, built in 996 AD. It's said that the son of an imam uh, named Nasruddin uh, constructed this mosque. It was destroyed by the armies of Genghis Khan in 1215 and then reconstructed during the Ming Dynasty and enlarged in the Qing Dynasty. Now, I think we have a, another picture. I like uh, this. Uh, there are still some ancient stone tablets and gravestones in the mosque. And I liked this. So I just put it in because <laughs> I liked the name, the Moon Watching Tower which actually served as the mosque's minaret for many centuries, but um, um, was actually for watching, uh, it's like, uh, it had a calendar sort of function. Now, the, the history of Islam and Muslims in China has been many, through many different phases, and um, uh, there were many different attitudes towards uh, Muslims uh, during each dynasty. So in the Tang Dynasty, as I said, um, when Islam first arrived, it was introduced by the diplomats, but also by scholars, merchants, scientists, and artists. And initially, it was mainly Arab and Persian emigrants who settled in China, who in many cases married the local Han Chinese women. Um, but a very important point in the history of the arrival and spread of Islam in China was the Battle of Talas River, shown in this Chinese block print, um, in which the Muslim army, the Abbasid army, defeated the Tang army. So in 750 AD, the Umayyads were overthrown by the Abbasids, and a year after that, 
the Abbasids confronted the Tang army uh, at this river, which is on the border of present-day Kyrgyzstan and uh, Uzbekistan, uh, Kazakhstan. Now, while the Abbasids b defeated the Tang army here, the Chinese army, they didn't continue an eastward expansion, which initially they wanted to do because they wanted to spread Islam right um, into China, but the army had become exhausted both in terms of morale and supply, so they stopped there. And uh, incidentally, it was after this battle that the Chinese papermaking industry was discovered by the Arabs in China, and they brought it to the capital of the Abbasid Empire and took it through their empire through to Andalusia and into Europe. And um, this battle, um, I just show you the Abbasid Caliphate there, and the, the pink bit there is uh, a vassal state of the Tang Empire. So, it was on the border there that this big battle happened. But this battle um, was a big turning point because it started a much larger influx of Muslims into China and uh, marks the beginning of a change in the religious profile of many parts of China. So not long after this battle, there was a rebellion by a Turkish uh, faction um, led by a man called An Lushan, seen here, who was a military commander and a governor. Um, Following this uprising against the Tang Emperor, An Lushan proclaimed himself emperor, and the Tang Emperor Su Zong, subsequently uh, seen here, um, apparently was influenced by the Muslim success in the Battle of Talas, so he wrote to the um, Abbasid uh, Caliph, uh, Al Khalifa Abu Ja'far al Mansur, asking for him to help defeat the rebellion. So the caliph responded by sending 4,000 men who helped retake the capital, but these 4,000 men settled in China. They took Chinese wives, and in effect, they established uh, the beginnings of the, the first major um, Muslim community in China. And their descendants are still among today's Hui uh, Chinese Muslims. Now, the Hui. A uh, minority group in China are descended from Arabs, but also Persians and Central Asians who intermarried with the Han Chinese communities. And they created uh, a very new and unprecedented new religious and multi-ethnic people who were united together only by their religion. Other religions, Judaism, Nestorianism, uh, uh, a branch of Christianity, and Zoroastrianism and Manichaeism all arrived in China give or take a century or two around the same time. But by the end of the Ming dynasty, Islam was the only religion that, to have survived and uh, spread and flourished in China. And uh, to this day, the Muslim community there form a key uh, part of the, the fabric of, of China. And um, so these are some Huey in uh, Xi'an. It's a very nice city, which uh, the, sen the old part of the city, um, this was Chang'an, the capital, is um, predominantly a Muslim quarter. So you see uh, the Chinese um, Muslim sc Arabic script all over the place. So yeah, um, according to the Chinese census, there were around 22 and a half million um, Muslims in China, but uh, unofficial uh, records uh, state to much higher numbers. And of these, 10.5 million are Huey, which are the descendants um, of uh, uh, these Middle Eastern people intermarried with the Chinese. And uh, this is basically where they spread. They speak Chinese, like all other Chinese people, and unlike eth other ethnic groups like the Uyghurs and the Kazakhs who speak their own language. And they have the Huey since Tang times, and I'll just show you that uh, again. So, um, from the seventh century onwards, uh, they've been through various periods of prosperity and tolerance, but also have been through dark ages. Um, the Tang period, as I said, was a golden age for both China and for the Muslims there. And, um, for example, um, even in times of difficulty, um, things were favorable for them. So, for example, in 801 AD, uh, 20,000 Arab and Samarkandi warriors were hired by Tibetan allies, and the Tibetans, through history, have always been at odds with the Chinese. And they penetrated Yuan province, and, and this is where I put that map 
at the beginning, which was supposed to be here, because I want to show you where Yunnan was, which is in South China near the uh, Vietnamese border, which was a kingdom at that time, um, called the kingdom of Nan Chao. So they, they tried to help these people overthrow their Tang overlords, and um, the Tang came in, and all the Muslims were captured, but rather than punishing them, the Tang Emperor allowed them to settle there and to marry Chinese women and even to serve in governmental and uh, military positions in the Tang bureaucracy. And after this, thousands and thousands of Arabs and Persians came to China and they settled on, uh, in the coastal cities of which, uh, I mean, they already had um, very old Middle Eastern communities there. And uh, they became very prosperous. Um, during the Song Dynasty, which is uh, the next dynasty after the Tang, there were further large arrivals of Arabs, Persians, and Central Asians, um, such as one group of over 5,000 who arrived from Bukhara with an emir who claimed to be a descendant of the Prophet. His name, according to Chinese, was Sufayr, -e, which people guess is Sufayr, and he was received with the um, much honor by the emperor, and he made him a Chinese nobleman. Um, the emperor allowed his group, again, to settle between um, a, a place called Kaifeng in the north and uh, another one called Yenqing, which is near modern-day Beijing, because he, the emperor wanted to create a buffer between the Liao, which they considered a barbarian kingdom, and um, the Song Empire. And that community still exists there, and Beijing has a very, very large Muslim community and a Muslim quarter. And it, it was under Sufair that the, the local uh, Chinese Muslims came to be called uh, the Huay Huay or the Huay, meaning the religion of the Huay Huay. And um, one of the descendants of Sufair was someone called Sayyid Ajal Shamsuddin, um, a very influential governor of Yunnan province, who was given a posthumous uh, princely title by the emperor. So he was made a prince. And he was responsible, um, Sayyid Ajil, for building a new city near Kunming in South China, w in which he ordered the building of a Buddhist temple and a Confucian temple and two mosques. Uh, and w one of the mosques is this one in Kunming, dated to the 12th century. Then his son, Nasruddin, became governor upon his death. And it's very interesting to note that um, there's a, a Huay belief in China, uh, the Huay being the, the Chinese Muslims, um, which link four surnames common in the region with uh, Nasruddin, the son of uh, Sayyid Ajil. So apparently um, the descendants decided to divide themselves into four branches and uh, they called themselves, you know, Chinese names are usually one syllable like uh, Tan and Lin and Wong. So they called the four branches the Na, the Su, the La, and the Din branches, so Nasul Adin. And uh, they exist today and uh, until today. And for example, the Ding family, which is in uh, Fujian province, claims descent, descent from Ajil uh, and from uh, Nasr al Din. And they have branches in Taiwan, in the Philippines, in Malaysia, all over. Um, not, they don't practice Islam anymore, but they still have that strong Huay identity. And during the next dynasty, which is the Yuan dynasty, I think, oh, this is uh, Sayyid Ajil's uh, um, gravestone with the um, Chinese Arabic script on the top. And yes, so during the Yuan dynasty, which was the Mongol dynasty in China, the military was heavily dependent on hundreds of thousands of Muslim soldiers brought from the Middle East and uh, Central Asia lands which the Mongols had conquered. And many of the commanders under the uh, Mongol um, emperors um, were Muslims, either Arabs or Persians. So for example, their Central China, the Southwest China, Southeast China, uh, the, all those commanders were either Arabs or Persians. And they're crucial in helping uh, the Mongols defeat the Song Empire. Now, one of uh, Kublai Khan's uh, grandsons, Ananda, was um, brought up by either Central Asian or Persian parents, and he learned about Islam from then, and he became a Muslim, a very devout Muslim. 
And um, some of his family tried to convert him to Buddhism, which he refused. And his defense was that um, the, his cousins the, uh, running the Ilkhanid Empire in, Persian were, in Persia were Muslims. And um, so during his leadership, um, he managed to convert most of his army to Islam. And so all through the Yuan dynasty, the Mongol dynasty, there were strong links between the dynasty and the emperors and the Muslim community. And they played a key role in both bureaucracy and uh, um, military um, activities during the period. And then during the Ming dynasty, which was after the Mong Mongol one, um, things changed. When China came back into non-foreign hands, so it came back into Han Chinese hands, um, some people expected that the uh, Ming emperors would punish the Muslims for, you know, working with the Mongols. But uh, on the contrary, um, it's said that the founder of the Ming dynasty, who is called the Hongwu Emperor, was a descendant of an officer in a Mongol uh, garrison in Anhui with links to the Muslim community. So he set out to protect the community. Um, however, he did have a policy of making the um, Muslims Chinese. So he was sinicizing them. He didn't want... He, uh, the, the Ming Empire closed itself off, unlike the Tang. They closed themselves off from the world. They didn't want foreign influences. And um, uh, so they started to develop independently, the Muslims in China, from outside China. So he made the Huawei attend Chinese schools, to speak only Chinese, to wear Chinese clothes, to take Chinese names, and also encourage them strongly to marry Chinese um, people. And he, the emperor, had a consort called Ma Hu, who um, uh, some people believe was either a Muslim or descended um, from Muslims. Um, but other scholars in China refute this claim. Um, um, whatever he had, um, the emperor, uh, whatever the truth of her descent, the emperor did have a Muslim son-in-law, and he had Muslim friends, and so they played, even though they were becoming very Chinese, they played a very big role during the early time of the Ming Dynasty. But also, this emperor is very famous for writing what's called the Hundred Word Eulogy, which is a poem in praise of Islam and in praise of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, which is a, a, Ch a Chinese classic now. Um, there's a translation there, which we can't read, but it's a, it's a nice poem if you care to look it up. So he had a, a very close connection with the Muslim community at the beginning of the Ming Empire, setting the scene for the rest of the empire. And so um, for most of the, that dynasty, they lived in prosperity. But during the reign of this emperor, Yongle, the third um, uh, Ming emperor, um, perhaps lived one of the most famous Chinese, which probably many people have heard of, uh, Cheng Ho, or as the Chinese call him, Cheng He, who was an explorer, and who was appointed by the emperor um, to lead uh, seven expeditions to the Indian Ocean, in which he visited more than 30 Asian and African countries and various parts of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, he, of course, went to Mecca and... Um, he stopped in Oman and various places like that. He also contributed, these are his trips, and he also contributed to the development um, of Islam in the, Qing dynasty, in the Ming dynasty. And it was he who asked the emperor to establish the Jingjue Mosque in Nanjing, which was built in 1388. In 1413, he was in Xi'an, looking for um, an interpreter for one of his voyages. And um, the Imam Hassan of the Da Shui Shi Xiang Mosque, which I mentioned earlier, which is this mosque, um, was chosen. And as recognition for what he did, um, Cheng Ho organized for the mosque to be refurbished and rebuilt. And there's a stone dated 1523, which commemorates um, Cheng Ho's connection to it, which I couldn't see, unfortunately, because it was under construction. 
And during um, Cheng Ho's time, there were many important developments, such, the, such as the establishment of uh, Islamic schools, madrasas, which was to train professionals, but also to teach Arabic and to teach Persian. And then they established, during this time in the Ming Dynasty, um, the Bureau of Translators, when they translated many Arabic, Persian, and Islamic classics uh, including um, doctrinal ones, but also Arabic grammar, rhetoric, and geography, and astronomy, and, and so on. But when the Manchu dynasty came in uh, um, 1644, I think, um, the Manchus wanted to punish the Muslims um, for their connections with the Ming and uh, the dynasties before them, so it began a period of persecution against the Muslims in China. Millions of people were massacred all over the country and as far west as um, uh, Sinkiang. And throughout all dynasties, there have been massacres of foreign communities. And uh, there was one in the um, ninth century during the Tang dynasty um, when there was economic hardship and as often happens, massacres of foreigners occur. And around 150,000 Arabs, Persians, Muslims, uh, Christians, and uh, Jews were massacred. And this is a Qing dynasty print of that. Now, um, there, there are um, several accounts over um, the centuries of how the Arabs and the Chinese perceived each other. And one of the earliest Chinese descriptions of the Arab world dates to the mid-8th century and was written by uh, Du Yu, this man. Um, in a book called The History of Institutions. Um, he never visited the Muslim world himself, but his relative, uh, Du Huan, pictured here, was captured at the Battle of Talas and taken to Kufa, which at that, that time was the capital of the empire. And he stayed 10 years in Kufa. And even though he was a prisoner, it seems that he had the freedom of the city and um, he met people. And towards the end of his stay, he even traveled across uh, um, the uh, Arab world. Now, he made many observations um, about um, that part of the world. He described what the people looked like. Um, he described their music, their food. He described their markets, their clothes. He described the women as um, tall and elegantly dressed, although they veiled when they went out. And he described men wearing silver daggers, um, like the Omanis and Yemenis do to this day. And um, he described their religious practices, such as praying five times a day. And he described also the great mosque of Kufa. Um, and uh, he mentioned that a king um, gave the sermons in the mosque, and he was referring to the second uh, caliph, Abu Jafar al-Mansur, who was uh, known to have been a very powerful uh, orator. And he describes the markets and the foods and the dates and the fruits and everything, really, very detailed uh, description of uh, Kufa. And uh, he mentioned their horses, and he even talked about the diseases they have had, including malaria. And um, another Chinese, there are other Chinese sources, um, such as the biography of the Emperor Suzong, which we mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, also, each dynasty would write a book about the previous one. So, for example, the Song wrote a book called The, the Book of Tang, which is about the Tang Empire history. And um, Arab communities were mentioned um, in the Book of uh, Tang. And in the book of the Song Empire, they're also mentioned, mostly um, uh, the mention of around 20 embassies coming to um, the dynasty. Uh, and they were ma mainly commercial, but they mentioned what they brought, such as cotton, damask, steel, rose water, oil, dates, and sugar. Now, the Arabs, again, this book would have been interesting. Um, one of the earlier sources of Arab knowledge of the Chinese was in the chronicles of two people, one called Suleiman al-Tajr and um, another one called Abu Zaid al-Sirafi, um, writing accounts of India and China. Now, al-Tajr visited China and India uh, several times, and he published his book in 851 AD, and, um, uh, which is basically like his memoirs. And um, 
Abu Zaid al-Sarafi added to the works of Al-Tajr and he gave a very good description of the city of Guangzhou. And um, these, of course, since been tra translated into French and, and English. Now, during that period, the main ports were in um, Basra and Saraf on the Gulf Shore, as well as the Imani ports. And a lot of the trade would come from those ports to across the Indian Ocean and uh, to China. And so their descriptions of China were a very well-organized and regulated society with a system to care for the sick and the elderly. And they, des he, they described the taxes the citizens paid and the schools and teachers in, in each town and city. And they even talked about tea, which at that time was only known in China. And um, so very detailed uh, chronicles. And uh, he also interestingly described the industriousness of the Chinese and how skilled they were at intricate crafts, such as engraving and manufacturing, which they, of course, still are to this day. Now, Arabic script in China is called Sini, or Sini. And it's a combination of Arabic writing with uh, Chinese style or flair. And it originated in eastern China, and where there are examples of it in tombstones and the interiors of mosques, such as this one here. When Islam first arrived in China, Arabic writing was, of course, introduced, and the script continued to develop through to the Ming Dynasty, when Sini reached its, uh, its best, really. And it was, um, maybe I'll mention it a bit later, but that was when the Chinese closed off their country and started developing independently. So Arabic and Chinese are uh, perhaps the two most important calligraphic art forms, and Sini is a product of the marriage of these two art forms. The script is Arabic, but the tools are Chinese. So Arabic you write with a pen, usually, and Chinese you write with a brush. Now Arabic script, um, oh, this is a Sini manuscript um, from the museum. Arabic script, the origins are not very clear, but generally believed that it descended from the Nabataean script, although there were many other scripts around the Arabian Peninsula, including in South Arabia, but also different cities had uh, different scripts um, named after the cities. So, for example, there was a, a script called Safaitic and Taymanic after Tayma in uh, northern present-day Saudi Arabia. But it seems Nabataean replaced all these scripts, and all over the region, the Arabian Peninsula and north into the Levant, there are thousands upon thousands of rocks and, with inscriptions and graffiti in these early scripts that date to between the 6th century BC and the 4th century AD. And it's only now, especially with the opening up archaeologically of Saudi Arabia, that um, the extent of these inscriptions is being discovered. Um, I think last year I mentioned one of these inscriptions, which was uh, a Tema Nitic one, uh, mentioning the last king of Babylon who lived, Nabonidus, who lived for 10 years in Tema in northern Arabia. And there are also other famous ones, uh, um, such as the Umm Jamal inscription in Nabataean and the 4th century um, uh, yeah, Al Namara inscription. And this is a very interesting um, find from Syria, which is written in Greek, in Syriac, and in Arabic at the bottom. Um, of course, I can't read it, but uh, it's the ancestor of Arabic. Um, by the time of the Prophet, the Arabic alphabet had developed into a script recognizable as modern Arabic script. And when the verses were revealed, um, the prophets would dictate to people who knew how to read and write. Some of these people were famous people. Um, and they were caught, called Katib uh, al-Wahi, the writers of Revelation. And um, as I said, a lot of these were famous. Um, of course, the preservation of the Qur'an um, was crucial. And as the religion spread, the third caliph, Uthman ibn Affan, in 651 ordered that the texts be officially canonized, so written down um, in a standard form. And he then had copies made which were sent to various territories such as Byzantium and Egypt and Persia and Ethiopia. These were written in early Hijazi and um, uh, 
they say that the, the first Qur'an was written in a script called uh, Jazm, of which there are various varieties depending on the town it came from, so uh, Medina or Mecca. But um, at the same time, other scripts developed, such as Ma'il, um, such as this piece we have in the museum, which is considered the predecessor of the Kufic script. So over the years, Arabic developed and changed, leading to the establishment of uh, various forms and styles. Nesakh in the ninth century became um, standardized, and within Nesakh there were other styles such as Thuluth and Ruqa. And by the 11th century, the six most popular scripts called the Aqlam al-Sitta, or the six pens, were firmly established, which we see here. So it's Nesakh, Thuluth, uh, Kufi, Ruqa, Diwani, and Ta'liq. And um, the uh, um, Nesakh, of course, was the most popular at this time. During the Abbasid Empire, calligraphy became a very important uh, field of study. There were colleges established um, to teach it, and uh, people would be awarded diplomas um, if they'd graduated from these college, colleges. Now, during this period, there were three very important calligraphers who set the foundations for the future, Ibn Muqla, um, who died in the 10th century, Ibn al-Bawwab, who died in the 11th, and al-Yaqut al, al um, who uh, I put this because it's like an examination piece, so um, it would be a collection of all the kinds of scripts that one might use, including the Diwani and the Thuluth and um, uh, Ta'liq and Nasikh and, and so on. This is like an examination piece. And um, so this is the sole surviving book by the very, very famous Ibn al-Bawab, which is in the uh, Chester Beatty Museum in Dublin. And this is a very nice Yaqut al Mustasumi um, signed 1282, which we have in the museum. Now, Ibn Muqla, he chose the six cursive scripts that we mentioned before, and he determined for these specific dimensions and uh, proportions. So he dictated how exactly they should be written. And his proportions were chosen to create something that looked attractive. And then they were refined by Ibn al-Bawab and uh, Yaqut al-Mustasumi. There were also, apart from the chronological uh, developments, there were also developments regionally, such as the type of script which is used in Persia and then the Diwani, which was developed by the Ottomans. And during the Ottoman period, calligraphy reached a very, very high level of excellence and produced many very famous and outstanding masters, such as uh, Al Amasi, of which we have a very nice book in the museum, and uh, Al Hafid Uthman. We also have a very nice book of his, a couple actually. And some people say that Islamic calligraphy was born in Baghdad, but matured in Istanbul. In China, we had uh, Sini. Now, Chinese script is one of the oldest in the world. I'm not going to talk about it, but I'm just going to show you this, how it developed from around um, 1500 BC. And you can see, for example, um, that was the symbol for a bird and how it developed over the generations through to the um, um, Song Dynasty when they developed a script called the Clark's clerical script because they wanted something which they could use to record quickly. And, um, but basically, Chinese um, characters have changed and developed, but you can see the connection between the regular and the original ancient script. Um, Sini, as I said, is uh, Chinese calligraphy using Arabic script. And there are various forms of Chinese Islamic calligraphy, but um, Sini um, is the formal style and is a rounded uh, flowing script whose letters are distinguished with the very thick and tapered effects. Um, there hasn't been much, uh, as I said, research about the origin, um, well, academic research about the origin and development of the script, and there hasn't been much either recording of the features of the script. But there are some works, like quite a well-known writer on um, a scholar on writing is uh, Yasin Safadi, who wrote a bit about the Chinese, and, and there was also a master's thesis by a girl called Wafa Ghanem, who, who did some research on it. In terms of uh, style, the closest Middle Eastern um, script to Sini is the Thuluth, such as we see on this band here, which is a cursive script. 
Um, that was used a lot in Persia and Central Asia during the 14th century, the Ilkhanid period. It became a standard script being used for inscriptions in mosques, um, such as this uh, tile here, in Persia and Central Asia. And also been found on uh, tombs in Guangzhou, uh, on one of the big Chinese uh, maritime coastal cities. Um, according to Yasin Safadi, the calligraphy, um, the similarity between Thuluth and Sini is that uh, typical in both, such as here, are the long vertical strokes for the letters like the elif and the lam, and the very rounded um, other letters like the sin, the ra, and the sad. Also typical are the very thin, thin ankles, maybe not so um, obvious here, but in, uh, in a Sini script it's quite obvious. And it's also um, uh, been compared to the Bihari script, which was the Arabic script of India, um, which also has the, the thin vertical lines and the very um, thick horizontal lines. And uh, they say the comparison, um, the similarity between Sini and Bihari is because of the use of the brush. But why did, um, this is another um, Bihari one, so why was it um, Nesakh Thuluth that came into China and uh, not Kufic? Well, uh, many scholars uh, believe that um, most of the people from the Middle East who came to China were merchants. And the scripts they would have been using predominantly would have been Nesakh. So they introduced the Nesakh rather than the more formal and monumental scripts that were used in buildings, um, for example. And, but this doesn't mean that Kufic didn't exist in China, it did. And for example, we have here a little tombstone um, written in Chinese and in early Kufic Arabic. And in Chinese, apparently, it says um, the tomb of a, a foreign merchant. And uh, this is from the Song Dynasty. Uh, some of the earliest write, uh, Arabic writing in China come from pottery such as this one dated to the Tang Dynasty, 8th or 9th century, um, which has, uh, you can't see it here, it's brown with green writing, and that is supposed to be a, an artistic rendition of uh, Allahu Akbar. And then there are other ones from many tombstones in Guangzhou, again, that big coastal city from the Song Dynasty. And uh, the tombstones there showed the development over time, because the very earlier um, tombstones were quite rough with very um, a script that wasn't very neat but um, you can see these which are around uh, 150 years apart how uh, they've developed both in the stonework and in the uh, elegance of the writing something very rough to something much more um, attractive to look at and um, Guangzhou is one of the most important Chinese ports um, the Arabs called Guangzhou Zeitun, um, supposedly because there was a, tr a tree in uh, Guangzhou which the Chinese called Sitong, and so the Arabs uh, sort of adapted that to Zeitun, meaning olive, but uh, I mean, olive had nothing to do with it. And um, it was a very important city uh, during both the Tang and the Song dynasties with big communities. And um, many, many tombstones uh, in Arabic were found, and of course Ibn Battuta visited there, as well as other, um, our other um, travelers we mentioned earlier, and they have a statue of him in Guangzhou. And um, many of the dozens and dozens of uh, Arabic lintels and um, gravestones were uncovered in the 1950s when they were developing China. And they were put in a famous mosque called the Ashab Mosque, uh, one of the very early Chinese mosques. And um, then subsequently they built this museum of the, um, uh, it's called the Maritime Museum, which basically deals with the Silk Road. And they have um, many inscriptions and um, stones with Sini writing on it, including this complete gar gallery, which was uh, very interesting. And. Um, that's uh, Sayyid Ajal's uh, um, tombstone with a Thuluth type writing on it um, from the 14th century. So, um, I'm going on. 
to. So um, some famous places with uh, very ancient uh, Sini script in them is uh, this uh, early one from the New Jia Mosque in Beijing. And this one, which I, unfortunately I didn't visit, but I managed to get a picture of, um, which is a, 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 a Ding Xian Mosque in Hebei province. And comparisons of script from the 18th century with those of today show the basic same characteristics of Sini. And uh, an exaggerated form was popular in China in the beginning of the 20th century. Now, in certain types of Sini, one can see what the Chinese called the Feibai, fl which means flying white in Chinese, which is the result of using a dry brush to write. And this has also transferred from um, regular Chinese into the Sini script, like this one we have in the museum, where you can see the Feibai um, script there. Another Chinese characteristic of Sini is the use of a square format um, for characters, which is typical in Chinese because Chinese characters are basically written in square form, but not in Arabic. And uh, again, we have several examples in the museum. Um, some of these pictures aren't um, the museum. So you can see um, the Arabic uh, words on the left and, and the right and the middle, actually, which are turned at an angle, um, which is in, in a typical Chinese fashion. And um, Arabic writing is more distinguishable, of course, as we know, by the, the, the cursive flow of the writing. But Ch Chinese are neatly contained within these squares. So temples and houses often have... Um, oh, this is just another example. Some more from the museum. Um, different ages. These are 19th century. And these quite large ones. These are just from the walls of the mosque in Xi'an and uh, the one in Beijing and uh, the Huaisheng Mosque in Guangzhou. Um, so yeah, Chinese houses or temples or public buildings often have um, a phrase written on top with the couplets down the side. So the Chinese have adapted this to the mosques. For example, like in this mosque here in Xining, where you've got the uh, Sini writing on the top and then the... Um, the squares going down the side, just like Chinese writing, but made to look Chinese. And um, uh, I, th I think this is a very attractive interior. This looks very natural to Chinese eyes, but for strangers' eyes who are used to reading Arabic or Persian, it, it doesn't look. Uh, um, it doesn't look. Uh, it's not a familiar look, but it's very common in Chinese. And um, scholars say that. It could come from, this is a very common practice in China where you put a word for luck on your front door. So the Arabic Sini is a modification of that. Another common form of Sini is um, where you take one letter, which we'll see in Arabic later, and the, the, the word is written around it, which the Chinese do. For example, in this word for tiger, which is a symbol of luck and strength, um, you can compare it to these ones, which are um, the Chinese often, Chinese Muslims often write Ya Allah or Ya Mustafa in the, a similar Chinese fashion. So that's another thing which you'll see common in um, a Chinese Islamic calligraphy. Also what the Chinese do, which uh, is done in many calligraphic uh, practices around the world, is to um, uh, design the calligraphy into a figure like these boats here. These are very large um, paintings, and also um, using the Chinese good luck symbol symbols like those uh, fruits in, in the bowl there. Now, in, in the museum, if you come to the museum in Jabria, you'll see um, many examples of uh, manuscript calligraphy, but you can also see some calligraphy dated to, say, the Ming Dynasty on ceramics and uh, on metalwork. Um, which were made for the, uh, both the foreign and the local markets, for the local Chinese Muslims. And um, so, for example, here we've got a 15th century dish from the Ming Dynasty. This is from another collection around the world. And um, this was just a description. Um, I showed how um, a very famous Chinese uh, um, Muslim calligrapher today called Haji Nuruddin um, was comparing Arabic writing 
Arabic, uh, classical Arabic writing to Chinese uh, Arabic writing, and he said that with Arabic, it's um, all according to the size of the dots, as I'm sure all Arab calligraphers will know, but with Chinese, it's more to do with the overall com composition, so you don't have the specific dimensions like you do in, in Arabic writing. Um, there are modern calligraphers, like this, this is by a Jordanian one, who studied both Chinese and Arabic, and this is all written in Arabic, but it looks Chinese, and that was his, his uh, sort of development to the art. And then this is an interesting one by Haji Nuruddin, who um, on the left, it's written, God is greatest in Chinese. Um, and then on the right, you have Bismillah Rahman Rahim. And in the middle, it looks Chinese, but I mean, it's difficult to read, but it's supposed to say Bismillah Rahman Rahim as well. And similar on this one, see if you, you read down that, it says Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Again, there. So, to our eyes, it just looks like Chinese writing, but to the Chinese, it's, it's Chinese Arabic writing. Again, on that one. So this is the, the imam of the mosque in Xi'an. He's a very famous calligrapher, and he has a shop right next to the mosque where he sells his stuff. And actually, he's been to Kuwait, and he exhibited in the great mosque in Kuwait. That's him. He, sp he speaks better Arabic than I do. And here you can also see in our museum some uh, nice uh, Chinese Sini um, calligraphy on books and ceramics. And um, it will be our pleasure if you visited. So thank you very much.